Uh, uh. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Mark Norris. I'm from UC Santa Cruz. Oh, I don't know why that's white. Uh, I hope it's not white later. But uh, I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about linguistics, which is kind of a broad field. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about what I do before I actually get into telling you about what I do. So methodologically, uh, theoretical linguistics has uh, methodologies that span all the way from having one-on-one -on -one conversations with speakers of other languages to doing um, lab-based experimental studies of speech, ph physiology, and processing. But we're all sort of interested in the question of what it means when you know a language. So why is it that you can look at the sentence at the top, there are 17 purple elephants on this slide, and identify that as a sentence of English, whereas a sentence at the bottom, there are purple elephants 17, slide this on, is very clearly not English. Um, this knowledge takes lots of different forms. You might talk about the way that sound uh, systems are built. You might talk about how those sounds are put together to form words and how those words are put together to form sentences and how we make meaning of those sentences. Um, in particular, I study the domain of word structure and sentence structure and their interaction. That's often called morphosyntax. And I study that by looking at uh, Icelandic and Estonian um, languages. Now, one uh, research tactic that we often take in linguistics, and I guess it probably in many other fields as well, is trying to draw parallels between seemingly different domains. Um, I think the idea is that if you find two things that look on the surface to be different, and you can boil them down to essentially the same thing, then that's a sort of simplification, and maybe by Occam's razor, then that's a, a, a good result. One example of domains that often get compared is the sentence and the so-called noun phrase. So if you take the sentence, Frank loudly played the piano, that mostly means the same thing as Frank's loud playing of the piano. And on the basis of this evidence and other evidence from a variety of language, languages, uh, some scholars have argued that in fact the structure of the noun phrase is sort of identical to the structure of the sentence on some deep level, represented by these technical diagrams here. I'm going to talk about the parallels between sentences and noun phrases in the domain of what's called agreement, which we could roughly say is when one word's form depends on another word's form. Uh, to give you some examples of what this agreement looks like, one common form you're probably familiar with is subject-verb agreement. This is when a verb indicates the person and number of its subject. For example, in the English, he walks versus I walk. You have this S in the he form, but not in the I form. Uh, and the, that's one kind of agreement. Another kind of agreement inside of noun phrases is this agreement that I call, or is often called nominal concord. This is, for example, when a demonstrative this agrees in number with its head noun, so this dog, these dogs. Um, and this is also seen in Icelandic and Estonian as well. Now, given that I preface this by saying we're looking for parallels between the sentence and the noun phrase, some scholars who have looked at concord have suggested, aha, we have subject-verb agreement in the sentence, we have nominal concord in the noun phrase, these must be two sides of the same coin. Uh, my dissertation argues that in fact that's the wrong kind of view and that concord and subject-verb agreement have a number of properties that make them at least distinct enough that you should not consider them as two sides of the same coin. So I'm just going to give you one piece of evidence, um, a, a sort of descriptive piece of evidence. If you take the Estonian sentence at the top, I've already eaten the yogurt, uh, there's only one instance of subject-verb agreement, and it appears on the verb. That's the little n at the top. If you take the example of nominal concord down at the bottom, all these two sharp scissors, notice that we have five instances of nominal concord, all these des and tes that are, are written there. And so simply the fact that there are more instances of it might make us think that something different is going on. So, I began this talk by saying we're looking for uh, parallels across different domains, and so now I've just told you that this instance of nominal concord is not the same thing as subject-verb agreement. Does that mean that we're going to lose this parallel between the sentence and the noun phrase? And what I'd like to show you is that no, we're not going to because there's another form of agreement, often called possessor agreement, that indicates uh, a possessed noun like house at the top or cow on the bottom agreeing with its possessor. So the woman on top, third singular or first singular down there for my cow. And in fact, in many languages, subject agreement looks exactly like possessor agreement. So in this sentence, I already washed my clothes, the subject verb agreement on wash is identical to the subject verb agreement on clothes. So it's not that we've lost a parallel between the sentence and the noun phrase, it's that by trying to, it's that nominal concord is not an example 
of the sort of subject verb agreement inside the noun phrase. That is possessor agreement, which sort of leaves us with this very open and interesting question as far as I'm concerned, uh, what would be nominal concord inside the sentence? There are a couple examples that I know of, but they're quite rare and quite sort of um, tenuous, so that's kind of what's to be done next, I guess. Thanks. Thank you.